So John Ogilvie's book from the 1700s depicts Indigenous American Canadians with black skin and kinky-haired afros. Let's listen to this. These are such weird videos. Why are you bragging about losing a war? <laughs> had the home field advantage too. How did you fucking lose? So I'm Jewish and we like, I'm literally crying. I'm Jewish and we like talking about the six day war, small country, surrounded on all sides, you know, defended ourselves in just six days. And you guys for the past 300 years have been screaming from the rooftops about how you lose, about how you lose all the time. You lose to everyone. You lose no matter what. Keep it a secret. Stop saying that. What's really interesting is that she says she is both native and Jewish. Check this picture out. So Canada belongs to Japheth and America to Ham, according to the Book of Jubilees. So why would this guy say stop talking about it other than to be insensitive to their struggle as mixed out indigenous people, Gentiles and Hamites? Well, here's indigenous Americans, Hamites, American dot and feather Indians as well as Canaanites, the Chinese. Watch my Lands of Shem, Ham, and Japheth playlist on YouTube for more information. Now, this is the difference between the Shemitic or Yashraelite indigenous person and the Hamitic indigenous person. So the Edomite and Jacobian Negroes of Europe, so Esau and Jacob Negroes of Europe and America, and the Hamitic kings of America are depicted above. Again, a Hamite of America is depicted below. Dark skin, straight hair. According to Jubilees, Shem got all of Africa, Western Europe, India, what they call the Middle East, Atlantis, in the middle of the waters, which they once called Shinar, and South America, South Central, which would be all the land of Shem. So read through Jub Jubilees 8, 9, 10 to find out about that. South America, according to books on Prester John, has always been known as the third Ethiopia or Cush, land of Shem and Ham. So the Castim or Chaldeans of South America were in Shinar, which is the West Indies area, as well as South America. And, but also during the Assyrian captivity, 27 to 1700 years ago, the 10 tribes of Israel were brought to the Americas and lived near Florida and the Chata Nation, South Central. Okay. And... The 12 tribes captive, the Jacobites, settled with the Edomite Black Palantine Boers along the Great Lakes and built it up. So the 10 tribes can be known as Sheminoles from South Central America. Okay? Land of Shem. Now, Georgia was won and settled and established by Negro soldiers from Canada and the West Indies, the Jacobites and the Edomite Black Palantine Boers. But what many don't realize is that this area near the park's West 85th Street entrance has an exceptional history. During the first half of the 19th century, it was home to Seneca Village, a community of predominantly Americans, many of whom owned property. The village existed between 1,825 and 1,857. In 1855 there were approximately 225 residents, a population that consisted of roughly two-thirds Americans, one-third Irish immigrants, and a small number of Germans. There were over 50 homes in Seneca Village, plus three churches and a school. For American property owners, Seneca Village provided residential stability and an investment in the future. Another incentive to owning property at the time was that it gave Americans the right to vote. When the city decided to build Central Park, it used eminent domain to acquire the land. Residents were compensated for their property and had to leave by 1857. After they dispersed, all traces of the settlement were lost to history. 
Since the 1990s, scholars and archaeologists have been working to bring the history of Seneca Village to light. In 2011, a group called the Institute for the Exploration of Seneca Village History collaborated with the Central Park Conservancy to conduct an excavation at the site. They uncovered stone foundation walls and thousands of artifacts from residents that offer valuable clues to better understanding this extraordinary community. Brendan Keefe shows you how the richest county in Georgia is now facing its racist past. It is hidden in a narrow patch of forest between rows of half million dollar homes. Even looking straight down, nothing betrays the mystery of what lies beneath. These tombstones are all that's left of the old Black Baptist Church at Stony Point. Look closely at the dates. Why do they all end before 1912? This is not evidence of promises broken, but of loved ones kept away because the men, women, and children buried here were the only black residents of Forsyth County, Georgia for nearly all of the 20th century. All of the Negro people had to leave. There was knocking on the door and they were told to get out. Elon Osby heard the story directly from her own mother, Willie Mae Bagley, just a two-year-old back in 1912 when the Knight Riders came to their home and so many others in Forsyth County. Can you imagine the fear that they would have felt? William and Ida Bagley paid taxes on 60 acres they owned in 1912. We could find no record of any sale in the county courthouse except those of white men later selling parcels of the Bagley's land to one another. The 1910 census showed the Bagley's among 1,098 black residents of the county, a tenth of the total population. By 1920, nearly every last one of them was gone. There are these long stretches where decade after decade, the black population of Forsyth County is zero. Historical photos show only white faces after 1912. So what happened that year? Thousands turned out to celebrate the public hanging of two black teenagers convicted in a single day by an all white jury of raping and murdering a white girl named May Crow. The other black suspect had already been lynched right here on the coming courthouse square. The lynching of Rob Edwards involved a very large crowd gathering outside the jail, dragging him out of the jail, beating him with crowbars, dragging his body around town behind a wagon, and then eventually his, his corpse is hoisted to, you know, on a telegraph pole and everyone in the crowd takes turns shooting into his body. Just across from the spot where Rob Edwards was lynched, Lady Justice faces history wearing her blindfold. But soil from the square has been collected in a jar, and the name Rob Edwards will soon join the lynching memorial at the Equal Justice Initiative. The Community Remembrance Project of Forsyth County really got this rolling and worked with the Equal Justice Initiative. So they're gonna put up a marker that will memorialize Rob Edwards and tell the story of, of that lynching. And that's going to be on the spot where he was lynched, which is, which is you know, something that I never thought I would live to see. This with the marker is a first step. There are already several hidden markers to the black community that once thrived here, now surrounded by new neighborhoods that are increasingly diverse. Some of those new residents are buying homes here on the land Elon's grandparents once owned. The old Bagley place is now among the most valuable real estate in Metro Atlanta. So this is why people get confused around reparations. Indigenous black Shemites, 10 tribes and 12 tribes of the Jacobites were here in built America before the whites came back. Yes, came back because the whites were Canaanites indigenous to America that shifted over to Western Europe. So, yeah, reparations are due to the Shemites of Yasharel from the continent of Africa and Europe and the Shemites of the third Ethiopia, South Central. And that's why people always say, well, if you're going to pay reparations to the Africans, you have to pay them to the indigenous people as well. Hope that helps everyone out. Barukat.